Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we've come in your name and we want to honor you and remember you. We thank you that even in front of us, every time we gather, we're reminded we have the remembrance that you died on a cross, that we might live. And we thank you we're alive, not just because we're breathing and our hearts are beating, but we're alive because by your Spirit, You've raised us up with you. And we're now alive in Christ. And that's how we want to celebrate and rejoice in you today. And we pray that everything that we think and say and enter into this morning would bring joy to your heart. And we know that joy is going to overflow into ours as well. And for this, we praise you in your wonderful name. Amen. Get to praise.
Let's pray and thank God for these people that are close to us who have been involved in this way. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for the, just that wonderful principle of honoring those who have gone before us and who have laid down their lives for us. Lord, we know that's such uh, an important thing. And we see it all through Scripture, Lord, as they looked back and honored, Lord, the, their forefathers in, in many different ways. And Lord, we just want to do this today. We want to say thank you for the place in which we stand, Lord, today with freedom that we wouldn't have had if these people hadn't have laid down their lives and fought for us. Lord, so we just want to thank you for, Lord, the, the example of sacrificial love and service, Lord, that we see in all of these names represented here this morning on this piano, Lord, those that have, have paid that price for us. And we know often, even if they didn't lose their lives, it had great cost for them. And Lord, we just want to say thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We want to thank you and we want to honor their memory, Lord. And we want to never forget 
Lord, what those have done for us. And Lord, may we take this as inspiration, Lord, that we may give our lives as we serve you, Lord Jesus, as we serve you for that even greater purpose, Lord, for freedom and salvation, Lord, of, of our nation and of this people that we know, Lord, that we would lay down our lives in serving the, them with the gospel. Lord, we thank you for that inspiration and thank you for that love, Holy Spirit, that you birth in each one of us that empowers us to do that. And we thank you together in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. Forgiven. Let's sing that again. Cause I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. Now I'm accepted. You were condemned. Now I'm alive and well. The Spirit is within. So, Lord, we just want to thank you that we can do what this song's words said today. Lord, that 
in all we do, we can honor you. Lord, we want to honor you with this moment of remembrance, a moment of remembering your love for us. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for your body broken for us. Lord, thank you that you, you gave yourself. You took up your cross. Lord, no one forced it upon you. Lord, you could have any, at any moment, Lord, turned away from the cross. You could have called for angels to rescue you. Lord, but you set your face to the cross. Lord, you took up that cross for us. Lord, you gave yourself, your life, your body, Lord, in our place. Lord, and we want to thank you this morning for your body broken for us. Lord, thank you that you not only died, Lord, but you suffered and died. Lord, you carried in yourself our sickness, our disease, and by your stripes we are healed. And Lord, so we thank you for your healing power this morning as we eat of this, this bread. Lord, we thank you for the healing of Jesus in our lives. Wherever we have need, Lord, we just release our faith to take hold of that today. Lord, as we eat together, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for your precious blood. Lord, thank you that as we as we sang, Lord, in that song in Christ alone, thank you, Lord, that on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Lord, we thank you that you took our place, Lord, so that we could stand before you as if we were Christ, as Spurgeon said, because you stood before God as if you were us. Lord, thank you for that great substitution that took place, that all our sin, Lord, was laid upon you so that it could be drowned in your precious blood. Lord, and we thank you that this morning we can know freedom and peace with God, forgiveness, Lord, and all our guilt, all our shame washed away, Lord, as we put our faith in that moment that you died for us. Lord, but thank you that you didn't stay dead. You rose from the grave, conquered sin, and you've given us victory through your blood. In Jesus' name. And we drink together, Lord, and we thank you for your blood. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I chose the cross with every breath, the perfect life, the perfect death. As you chose the cross. of thorns you wore for us, you crowned us with eternal life, cause you chose to cross, the story so was overwhelmed with pain, obedience and death you overcame, let's sing, lost in one. Lost 
going to read uh, from Romans chapter 5, uh, the first um, 11 verses, and I'm taking it from the Passion Translation. Um, so it's a, a slightly different one to uh, what you're probably used to, but it really is an incredible few verses. And it's entitled, Our New Life. Now that should get us excited straight away, shouldn't it? Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us and he now declares us flawless in his eyes. Just let that verse sink in for a moment. This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God all because of what the Lord Jesus, the anointed one, has done for us. Our faith guarantees us permanent access into his, this marvelous kindness that has given us a perfect relationship with God. What incredible joy bursts forth within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experience of God's glory. But that's not all. Even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence knowing that our, presence, uh, our pressures will develop us in patient endurance. And patient endurance will refine our character. And proven character leads us back to hope. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy, because we can now experience the endless love of God, cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who lives in us. Now, who would dare die for the sake of a wicked person. We can all understand if someone was willing to die for a truly noble person, but Christ proved his love, his passionate love for us, 
by dying in our place while we were still ungodly. And there's still much more to say of his unfailing love for us. For through the blood of Jesus, we have heard the powerful declaration, you, we, are righteous in my sight. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you will never experience the wrath of God. So if while we were still enemies, God fully reconciled us to himself through the death of his son, then something greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are at peace with God, and because we share his resurrection life, how much more will we be rescued from sin's dominion? And even more than that, we overflow with triumphant joy in our new relationship of living, of living reconciled to God, all because of Jesus Christ. I cannot think of more powerful words to bring to you on a, a Remembrance Sunday. Since 1919, for the, or for the last 103 years, we've celebrated and remembered this day, Remembrance Day. A time to remember those who fought and gave their lives for our nation. To remember the innocent civilians who died as a result of conflict. To remember the acts of pure inhumanity that happened particularly during the Second World War, with the Nazi murder of six million-plus Jews, just because Hitler hated them. It's a poignant reminder to us today, isn't it, that uh, despite all the attempts to bring peace into this world, we are perhaps facing uh, the greatest threat of global conflict through uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine back in March of this year, and China's threatened invasion of Taiwan, probably since 1945. Sadly, we seem to have learned nothing from the mistakes of history. We've all witnessed a plethora of despot dictators over the centuries causing untold misery, destruction, and the senseless loss of human life. Yet, should we really be surprised by war and conflict. Didn't Jesus warn that such things must happen? Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 to 8, we read, You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now, while it may not be possible for the nations of this world to live in peace with each other, I believe there is a far more precious and greater peace that we can have, and that is to live in peace with God himself. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Isaiah the prophet proclaimed this, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. In the opening verses of uh, uh, this passage I read a few moments ago in Romans 5, Paul sums up exactly what Jesus has done for us. And uh, I'm going to read that opening verse again. Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us. And now we are flawless in his eyes. Can you imagine a beautiful diamond, you know, that is sparkling and perfect without a flaw in it? It's precious. And that is how God sees us today. We are precious to him. We are flawless in his eyes. And that, what, what that opening verse has a kind of knock-on effect because from knowing the peace of God, our lives are transformed. First, we have to accept Jesus. That we know uh, to be true. We cannot uh, come to faith in God without, 
by any other means than through Jesus himself. But once we have done this, once we have uh, realized that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, once we said yes to him in our lives, then that transformation takes place. And as we do so, as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us more and more, we can experience not just the peace of God, but his perfect love, his perfect joy, and the other fruits of the Spirit as well. In uh, John 14, chapter, uh, John chapter 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. You know, the peace of God is unlike any other peace we may ever know. And it was only made possible because the sacrifice of Jesus that he made for us on the cross. A horrific, excruciatingly painful and humiliating death. The sacrifice that he made was to give his perfect life for our imperfect ones. Jesus didn't die peacefully in his sleep. He was beaten and tortured and scourged. He was nailed to a cross with cinch-cinch nails hammered through his wrists and his feet. We know that crucifixion was a barbaric form of execution, usually used by the Romans uh, for, um, uh, as, a, as a warning against those who would usurp the authority of their precious uh, state. Yet the shame and the repulsion associated with crucifixion is not lost to the gospel writers. Uh, they all give a graphic account of Jesus' death. They don't hold anything back. John, perhaps more than the others, dedicates the la or the 10 of his 21 chapters to the last week of Jesus' life. And uh, this is where we see the climax of his mission, the Messiah's mission, and the launch of what we can only describe as agape love. Agape is the Greek word for the most precious and the selfless kind of love there is. And to truly fully understand what Jesus did for us, we need to go back to the beginning of what we now call Holy Week. I'm going to um, go through this fairly quickly because it's the last bit I really want to concentrate on. But imagine for one moment you are back in circa AD 33. You're in the center of Jerusalem and you join thousands upon thousands of Jews as they come into the city to celebrate Passover. The atmosphere is electrifying and uh, there's anticipation uh, as the Passover celebrated the old exodus, that something new and exciting was going to happen, a fresh act of deliverance from Roman oppression. At the start of the week, Jesus raised the expectations by riding down the Mount of Olives on a donkey in direct fulfillment of an ancient prophecy that we read in Zechariah 9.9. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. To the Jews, this was a clear message and they welcomed him by waving palm branches and, and shouting, Hosanna, which means save us. It seemed liberation for the Romans was at hand. But by the Monday, the crowds began to be disappointed and disillusioned with Jesus. Instead of attacking the Romans, he went into the temple and unleashed his fury on the moneylenders and those who were selling livestock for sacrifices. In an act of judgment on the greedy and, uh, and uh, on the greed and hypocrisy of the religious leaders, Jesus had come to Jerusalem for a fight, but not against the Romans. He had a much darker and pervasive enemy in his sights. Thursday came. And uh, being the official day uh, to celebrate Passover with a symbolic meal. We've already done that this morning. Uh, and Gemma did such an amazing, uh, incredible job over the last couple of weeks in describing the bread and the wine and the new covenant, that marriage covenant that we have with God. I'm not going to go there again this morning. 
But I am going to just skip to when we took that cup of wine that we all did just a few minutes ago. And Jesus said, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Just hold that verse in your mind for a second. See, while Jesus wasn't being literal about drinking his blood, he was alluding to the Passover lamb, whose blood had been daubed on the, uh, the lintels and the doorposts of the Israelites' homes. Scripture tells us that after, Jesus, after supper, Jesus led his disciples out across the Kidron Valley into the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's here and now that Jesus realizes the full horrors of what is about to take place. And it's too much to bear. Falling to his knees, he understands that the cup of forgiveness he's just shared with his disciples, the cup of judgment for the sins of the world, he now must drink. His sweat like drops of blood fall to the ground as he prayed to his father. Here is the sinless Son of God, God in all his fullness and majesty, now the perfect Lamb of God, about to be sacrificed for my sins and for all our sins. Anything with anything less than agape love would have turned back at that point and run for it. But we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that Jesus regarded the cross as a joy, knowing that because of his sacrifice, we were all given an opportunity of new life in him and through him, experiencing his peace and to live in a new relationship with his Father. Then the horrors began. Arrested, oh, sorry, betrayed, arrested, falsely tried and sentenced to death. Jesus, on that first Good Friday morning, was crucified. The Son of God, having taken upon himself the dregs of divine judgment, the innocent Son of God, who took the place of the guilty, just as Isaiah foresaw centuries earlier. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. With his final breath came the cry, It is finished. Oh, how I love those words. No, not a cry of defeat, but one of victory. The curse of sin that marred creation the despot dictators who want to dominate this world, the sin that enslaves countless millions of people's hearts, it is finished. God demonstrates his love like this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. After the burial of Jesus' body in a borrowed tomb, it seems that all hope was lost. Uh, the mighty Romans had crushed yet another would-be do-gooder and restored the status quo. But they counted without uh, knowing who Jesus was. By Easter Sunday morning, uh, proved the defining moment in history, and by the Monday morning, the whole world would be different forever. Because on that first Sunday, Jesus rose again from the dead, just as he said he would. And Jesus was not to revive from death, but broke through it. He triumphed it over it, and now lives and reigns on the other side of death with his Father in glory forever. God himself, in human form, was alive. Not just alive, but alive forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good. The resurrection of Jesus has been widely disputed over centuries. But if it's true, and I have absolutely not a shred of doubt that it is, um, it is a real game changer for each and every one of us. Very quickly, I just want to go over the evidence that there is to prove 
uh, that he is alive. First of all, um, even, even disbelieving or non-Christian historians accept three particular things. First of all, the tomb was empty. The Jewish leaders claimed that the disciples came and stole his body in an effort to fool people into thinking that he'd risen. Yet the Romans had placed a guard on that tomb. The linen that uh, was uh, wrapped around his body and the napkin that was on his head were left folded on that uh, stone slab. The Gospel writers, especially John, as they give us a, a vivid account of those who witness the empty tomb. The women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, Salome, uh, all came with embalming, uh, uh, to embalm his body on that first day. Uh, and they were followed by Peter and John. The disciples, the second thing, disciples claimed that Jesus appeared to them and many others as well on one occasion to 500 people in just one day. I love the encounter with Mary Magdalene who thought Jesus was a gardener. And uh, she asks him, you know, what they've done with his body. But Jesus calls her by name because he's alive. And he calls each one of us by name because he is alive and has the power to set us free. We read in Luke's account of the gospel of, uh, of the two disciples leaving Jerusalem and out of despair, heading for Emmaus. And as they walked and talked on their journey, convinced that Jesus was dead, that it was over, Jesus came and walked beside them. And he explained why the Messiah had to suffer, to die, and then to be raised again to life. And once the, these two characters, when Jesus had left them, they, they, they realized it was him. And they said this incredible thing. They said, were not our hearts burning as he talked with us on the road? Are our hearts burning today as we hear again the good news of Jesus? Burning with excitement and gratitude for what he's done for each and every one of us. Perhaps the most compelling evidence of all was the explosion of Christianity in those early years. And today, we have uh, about one-third of the world's population who are followers, disciples of Jesus. We may not see many coming to faith in our nation because, sadly, we've turned our back on God in this country. But we're seeing it in other countries. Iran, that hotbed of, uh, of Islam, in China, and so many others. Thousands of people, young people in particular, receiving and accepting Jesus. And that's exciting. There had been many other so-called messiahs uh, in the past. I'll give you one example. Judas of Galilee, um, a self-proclaimed messiah uh, who um, gathered some followers and was finally executed by the Romans in AD 6. The movement died with him. And on that basis, we could have expected Christianity was doomed in the same way. But, uh, oh no, far from it. I love the, the quote from um, Tom Wright, uh, who's a leading biblical scholar. And he says this, I cannot explain the rise of early, and, uh, early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb. Today we experience that victory. One of the most notable features, perhaps, of, of the risen Lord Jesus were the scars that he bore uh, following his uh, resurrection. Uh, Thomas even had the opportunity to put his uh, hands in, in the wounds uh, of Jesus. Uh, and these wounds prove, uh, not only provide us a visible proof of his victory, but also give us, us an experience of his victory today. Those scars tell a story of God's love in action. Because Jesus was mortally, mortally wounded, is now alive and whole. And knowing his peace allows him to heal our brokenness and restore our fractured world. Thomas Aquinas, back in uh, uh, the 11th century, said this, Christ kept his scars not from an inability to heal them, but to wear them as an everlasting trophy of his victory. 
I want to finish this morning by uh, giving an illustration of what I believe this healing power of Jesus is, and not because it's it's an all-encompassing one. Um, you know, it comes with knowing His peace, knowing uh, His joy in our lives. But this this illustration comes from a a, a very old Japanese art form um, of of mending broken pottery or, or china, whatever it might have been. And it's called um, Kintsugi. It's a funny name. But the name literally means golden joinery. And the process involves taking resin mixed with pure gold to reassemble the broken item. The piece, uh, the result is of a pot or a vase or whatever it might be that is of greater value, considerably greater value or worth than the original piece would have been. Uh, and instead of hiding the repair, you know, we watch on um, uh, 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 the uh, repair shop, um, that lovely lass who repairs broken pots, you can't see the joints, they're perfect. But this, um, it, it sh this method of repairing brokenness, the gold is visible throughout all the repairs. And it becomes part of the aesthetic beauty. The golden scars tell a story. This provides, I believe, as I say, a powerful illustration of the true healing works of our Lord Jesus, of the risen King. His sacrificial love is that golden resin. You know, the lives of so many in Scripture were, were touched by it. Uh, Zacchaeus, Mary, Peter, Thomas, and so many more can all testify that Jesus will take our broken lives and put them back together so they're far more beautiful and far more valuable than they were before. Do you know, I'm, I'm going to embarrass Penny now, but uh, I'm always thankful to God for my Penny. You know, we were two broken individuals. And God has made one whole out of the two of us. Let's not hide our brokenness from God. Instead, let's hand him our brokenness, our broken pieces, and live to see what he will do with them. You know, he will willingly take them and so carefully and lovingly restore them. And when he's finished, yes, the scars will be visible, but we will be a, a part, of, th those scars will be part of the beauty of his completed work of art. You and me. And it's all part of the finished work of the cross, knowing his peace, his love, his joy in our lives. A far greater peace than the world will ever know, because it's the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning that you are such a gracious and loving God. We thank you for the gift again of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus. And we thank you for this new life we have through him in you. We thank you for this beautiful love, this golden resin that restores relationships with you that mends the brokenhearted, that heals the wounded, that restores shattered lives. We praise you and we thank you. We bless you this morning, Father. And uh, Lord, we just pray again for all those who gave their lives as a sacrifice in war for this country to defend us from the enemy. Lord, so many of them knew you and now reign forever with you. And we just lift up all that we've uh, named in those uh, lists on the, uh, on the piano this morning before you and say thank you for them. But most of all, we say thank you for, to Jesus for giving your life in exchange for ours. We bless you in his name. Amen. Amen. The glory and great things he has done. So I love to go well that he gave us his.
Yeah. Mm-hmm. 